All right. Hello. Am I still? Hopefully, it's not too loud or anything. All right. So, hello, everybody. I'm not quite sure how well you can see me here because I'm uh, I'm outside in the dark and I don't really have much light on my face. I think only my eyes are visible. But, hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Cabin Fever Astronomy Live. So, I am out right now on the roof of a. Uh, of the uh, building that the Alderman Planetarium is located within at, in a science hall on the campus of Rowan University. And it is a really, really clear night tonight. So there's a little bit of wind, but hopefully we'll be able to see a lot of really fun stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and actually switch our feed over to a uh, live view through a telescope. So right now we are facing the moon. And because of how clear the conditions are tonight, we can actually see quite a bit of detail on the surface of the moon here. So one thing you might notice, first off, is that the uh, right now we're only able to see about half of the moon. So right now the moon is in what's known as the first quarter phase. That is to say that about a week ago we were in new moon where we couldn't really see much of the moon's surface because it was uh, not really in a good placement in the uh, sky. And uh, right now we can see about half the moon. So we can see roughly the right half of the moon. And so the other part of the moon here is facing away from the sun and we can't really see it, it's far too dim. So first thing you might notice here looking at the moon is there are two uh, different uh, brightnesses of areas basically. We have a sort of brighter surface around here-ish. And then there are darker regions like right there. These darker regions are known as maria, which means uh, lake or sea, because early observers looking at the moon thought that these were actually lakes on the surface of the moon. Now we know that these are actually the result of uh, impacts on the moon, where asteroids came and collided with the surface of the moon. And when they did that, they punctured the surface and allowed lava to flow up. And this lava or magma create, filled up these basins on the surface of the moon that were left over from the impacts and eventually it solidified. So these are effectively lava plains. So it was in a sense a lake or a sea at some point, just a sea of lava that ended up cooling to form these darker regions. So something else you might notice, right along this line known as the terminator, which is the uh, defining line between the night and uh, day sides of the moon, this of course being the day side, this being the night side, Right along the Terminator, we can see shadows cast by mountain ridges and by craters on the surface. So you can see a lot of really, really cool detail on these craters. And I'm going to see if I can actually zoom in a bit here, if my computer will uh, allow me to. So we can see some really, really cool detail with these craters. This is actually great. I guess the sky conditions are really awesome tonight. So something you might notice looking at the crater I just zoomed in on, is we have this nice circular crater, which again formed when an asteroid impacted with the surface of the moon. And they're right at the center. You can see it on this crater, you can also see it on this crater, is this little kind of like mountain thing, or like right in the center, this little peak. So that is also something that can form sometimes when a uh, something hits the surface and creates a crater. So that's kind of the result of uh, basically material coming back up, sort of like a, think of it kind of like a ripple in water. So we have a little mountain that can form in the center of these craters, and we can see some pretty cool detail on other craters around here. But something else you might notice is that the length of these shadows is totally different between all of these craters, because the craters right next to the Terminator are just about to go into nighttime. Or rather, in this case, they're actually, uh, I suppose this is actually morning for them, so they're, uh, going into daytime, but we're effectively seeing the effect of a sunrise right along here, where only a little bit of sunlight is reaching the top of, kind of the back of the crater there, and it's mostly in shadow. And the craters a little bit further past the Terminator are effectively early, later into the day. So the angle of the sun in the sky at those, uh, on those areas of the, uh, of the moon's surface is a little bit higher, so we can see more sunlight getting into the crater, allowing us to see other uh, features in the crater. So, let's go ahead and zoom back out here. Unfortunately, something you might have noticed while I was zooming out there is that uh, for a little bit, the uh, the nice, clear, sharp image 
of that crater got a little shaky and that's because as i said it is a little bit windy here tonight so throughout the night we might have pretty clear images sometimes and then we might get some really 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 shaky images so i'm gonna see if i can pull up the uh chat here if anybody has any questions about the moon I'm going to go ahead and switch over to something, but if anybody if anybody has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or unmute your microphone, and I can try to answer any questions you might have if you have any questions about the moon or about what I just discussed here. Feel free to unmute yourselves. By the way, if you have any questions at any point tonight, just unmute yourself and ask those questions. How old is the moon? So that's actually a pretty good question. So... I should probably start off with how the moon formed. So early, early on in the history of the solar system, our solar system was filled with a lot of what are known as protoplanets or early planets. And these planets were rather small and they would occasionally collide. They'd bump into each other and they'd merge and form a bigger planet. And something that happened somewhat early on in the Earth's history is a Mars-sized protoplanet. So a new planet about the size of Mars collided with the Earth and basically knocked off a chunk. And that chunk formed a ring around the Earth, which eventually formed the Moon. So um, going off memory, I believe that happened a few hundred million years or possibly a little bit less than that uh, after the Earth formed. So the Moon is about as old as the Earth is. The Earth is about four and a half billion years old or about four and a half thousand 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 years old. So the moon is a little bit younger than that. Does the ground feel like dirt or rock? Well, so the ground is actually, the surface material is known to scientists as regolith, but roughly the soil of the moon is actually really dusty. So if you ever go and watch any videos of the uh, Apollo astronauts kind of walking around on the surface of the moon, you'd actually see them kicking off a lot of dust. So it's somewhat soft, but it's really just kind of like a sandy, dusty surface. How much does the moon weigh? Well, that's a bit of a complicated question. So first off, your weight is actually how much, on Earth anyway, your weight is how much the Earth is pulling you down. So that isn't actually a question of the, how much you weigh. If you went to the moon, you would actually weigh less. The moon doesn't really have a weight because it's not pulling itself down, right? It, it is itself, but it has a mass, how much stuff is in there. And I don't actually have that. I don't actually have that memorized off the top of my head. So give me one real quick second here to try to look that up. That is something I might have had in my head in the past, but... Alright. It is roughly 2 to the power of 23 pounds. Let me try to do the quick math on that. So that would be roughly... About 2 million billion 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 pounds. So that's about two, or really, um, well, yeah, two, roughly two, with about 23 zeros after it. That's a whole lot of stuff. The moon is really, really, really big. It has a lot of stuff in it. All right, these are some good questions. Does anybody else have any questions about the moon? All right. If not, then I'll go ahead and right next to the moon in the sky right now, we actually find a red dot. And oh, why is the moon glowing? So the moon doesn't actually glow, it reflects light. So as I was mentioning before, we have two sides of the moon that we kind of see, right? We have this darker side and we have this lighter side. And the lighter side is the side that is facing toward the sun. So. What we're actually seeing is light reflected from the sun. And what's also pretty cool is that if you were on the moon and you could see this from a photos taken from the moon, 
uh, by the Apollo astronauts, if you were on the moon, you would actually see the, the Earth in much the same way. So the Earth is reflecting light toward the moon from the sun, and the moon is reflecting light toward the Earth from the sun. And how does the moon change shapes? So what this is, is it's known as phases, the moon's phases. Oh, oh, that was really cool. I'm not sure if you saw that uh, turbulence, the weird stuff that went by the moon. An airplane just passed right in front of the moon as we see it here. So uh, how does the moon change shapes? So what that is, is it's known as phases. So as the earth, sorry, as the uh, moon orbits around the earth, Sometimes it'll be kind of a little bit to the left of the Earth, sometimes it'll be behind us, sometimes it'll be a little bit to the right, sometimes it'll be in front of us. And as it's doing that, uh, basically the one side is always, is always going to be facing the sun, right? As the moon is orbiting around us, we see the... Let me back up and start that again, sorry. What we're basically seeing is the different uh, daytime and nighttime cycles on the surface of the moon. So again, this this line between the bright and dark side is known as the terminator, and that's where it's either going into where parts of the surface of the moon are going into uh, nighttime, or where they're going into daytime. So we're really just seeing what side of the moon is being lit up by the sun, what side is currently daytime. So as it orbits around us, we see a slightly different side of that because its position in space relative to the Earth is slowly changing. So the moon actually sees phases of the Earth as well. And it's pretty much the opposite of whatever phase we're currently seeing of the moon. So the new moon phase is when the moon is roughly between the Earth and the sun. So the daytime side of the moon is facing away from us, and we see its nighttime side. And then on the moon, the moon is seeing the daytime side of the Earth, and vice versa. Um, when the Earth is roughly between the sun and the moon, we're seeing the daytime side of the moon, so we see a full moon. And right now, which is pretty much right off to the left, or right off to the right, depending on your perspective, it's off to the side. And so we're seeing half of the daytime side and half of the nighttime side. How big is the moon? The moon is pretty big. Uh, I believe... I'm just going to double check this by Googling it. Google is an awesome resource, by the way. I believe the moon is about a quarter the size of the Earth. At least if measured from one side to the other. Yeah, so it's about a quarter of the width of the Earth. So it is really, really, really big. The reason why it looks kind of small in the sky, though, is because it is a crazy distance away. It's about a quarter of a million miles away. But it's so big that even though it's a quarter of a million miles away, it still appears as rather large in our sky. All right. Does anybody have any more questions about the moon? All right, well, in that case, then I'm going to go ahead and move us over to something else. So, as I was saying, right next to the moon in the sky right now, there's also a red dot. That red dot is actually a planet. Does anybody know which planet is the red planet? Feel free to unmute yourselves or say it into the chat. Mars! Yeah, it's Mars. So, we are going to move our telescope over to the red planet Mars. Just right next to the moon in the sky. Alright, someone else in the chat asked, why does the moon look different shapes sometimes? And again, that is due to the phases. So it's pretty much, we're seeing whatever's the daytime side of the moon as it's going around the Earth. And that's slowly changing because it's moving, actively moving around the Earth as it orbits. So the different phases are caused by it being in a different position with respect to the Earth. And so sometimes we'll see the nighttime side or the new moon uh, fully if it's right between the Earth and the Sun. And sometimes we'll see a little sliver of light, a little bit of the daytime side. Sometimes we'll see all of the daytime side when the Earth is between the moon and the Sun, and that is the full moon. So that red dot 
or that red little circle thing you can see there is the planet Mars. And Mars is a little bit bright. So right now, it's a bit too bright for my camera to see super nicely. It's completely oversaturating, or uh, too, way too bright for the, uh, for the camera sensor to see. So I'm going to try to take a picture of it in a slightly different way. And we'll see if we can get a bit of detail out of the surface. So I can't zoom in a whole lot more than that, but if you have a really, really good eye, you might be able to see a little bit of a dark feature there and some other brighter features. Well, you know what? I'm going to see if I can zoom in any more on here. Give me one quick second. Not that much. Alright. So look in there. You can see a little bit of a darker area. Oh my cursor, there we go. You can see a little bit of a darker area as well as some lighter areas. Unfortunately, though, it appears to be a little bit too windy to really see much uh, detail on the surface here. So unfortunately, because of the wind uh, that we're experiencing here on the roof of this building, that wind, as it passes by the telescope, will shake it ever so slightly. So even with a really, really powerful and really, really stable telescope, that little bit of shaking is going to mess everything up. So if you want a really sharp photograph that you're taking with the camera on your phone, for instance, you need to hold your phone really, really, really still, right? But with the telescope shaking even a little bit, instead of getting a nice, sharp, crisp image, we get a really kind of slightly blurry image. So we can't really see a whole lot on the surface of Mars here as a result of that, but you can see a little. Uh, somebody asked why there are no stars. So, there are stars, it's just they are far dimmer than the other things we're looking at. So, if I wanted to take a long duration picture with the camera on this telescope, we would start to see some stars. But most of the stars in the area of the sky I'm looking at are way, way, way dimmer than Mars and way dimmer than the Moon. So if I have the camera on this telescope set to be able to see the moon or Mars well, then everything else is just far too dark. It doesn't see it. Somebody asked uh, why the moon has holes in it. Those holes are known as craters, and they come about when things hit the surface of the moon. So when an asteroid hits the surface of the moon, and it impacts with the surface, it knocks out a little chunk of the moon. It creates this hole in the ground. Well, it's not really a hole. It's more like a little chunk of the, uh, the surface knocked out. It's kind of like a dent on the surface of the moon, in a sense. All right, let's see if I can try to get another, a newer picture of Mars here. Maybe we can get a slightly better one. No, not a whole lot better, unfortunately. That is A-OK. -okay. So, something else that's really cool, unless anybody has any questions about Mars before I continue. Oh, someone asked how often the moon gets hit by meteorites. So, the moon 
Well, first off, uh, meteorites are actually the chunks of uh, an asteroid or something else that impacts uh, an object that actually survives the impact. So it's really a question of how often it gets hit by other chunks of stuff from out in space, by bits of comets or by asteroids. Uh, it's not super duper common nowadays. Way earlier on in the moon's history, it was incredibly common. There was actually a period in the uh, history of the of the uh, solar system known as the early bombardment period, when the planets and everything were still forming, and there was just a ton of stuff floating around out in space that could collide with those planets. Uh, at that time, the Earth, the Moon, everything else was hit by a lot of asteroids and other such stuff. But it's not super frequent nowadays. But there are cameras which are constantly pointed toward the moon to watch for little flashes of light that might occur on its surface. And those flashes of light are when an object, an asteroid, collides with the surface, knocks off a chunk, and throws a whole bunch of dust and stuff up into the uh, space just above the surface, which will reflect a lot of light and make that area really, really, really bright for just a little bit. So we do occasionally see asteroids impacting with the surface of uh, the moon, but it's not super duper common. Which is why when the astronauts went to the moon, they weren't too afraid of getting hit by a chunk of space rock. Why is Mars red? Actually, I first answered the question just before that. Why don't we see the dark side of the moon? We do see the dark side of the moon. There are two sides of the moon we're seeing right now. We're seeing a dark side and a bright side. The bright side is the side facing toward the sun, and the dark side is the side facing away. So the bright side is the daytime side, and the dark side is the nighttime side. I think what you mean is why don't we see the far side of the moon? So the moon is something known as tidally locked. That is to say, it takes about a month to orbit around the Earth. And it also takes about a month for itself to spin around on its axis. So a day on the moon is about the length of one month. And it takes about a month to go around the Earth. And what that means is one side is always facing the Earth and one side is always facing away. So the side that's always facing the Earth, we call the near side and the side that's always facing away, we call the far side. So because the moon is tidally locked and one side is always facing us, we cannot see the far side of the moon. However, we do see the dark side of the moon all the time, quite often, because it's just part of the phases. It's the side of the moon that's not currently being lit up by the sun. Unfortunately, it seems that Pink Floyd kind of messed up what a terminology people often use for these two parts of the moon. I'm not complaining, I like Pink Floyd, but unfortunately, that terminology is often kind of confusing. So why is Mars red? Mars is red because of its surface. Its surface is covered in the chemical known as iron oxide. You're probably familiar with iron oxide under another name, rust. The surface of Mars is covered in rust. And just like rust on your car or elsewhere is often kind of an orangish red color, the moon is also, sorry, the uh, Mars is also an orangish red color. It's the same color because it's from rust. So, Mars is a rusty planet. What causes the aura ring around the moon? That ring is often caused by particles of ice high up in the Earth's atmosphere. So as light passes through those particles of ice, they can act sort of like a prism. And they could focus some, some specific colors of the light down to your eye that might have otherwise taken a, a path that wouldn't have hit your eye. So basically, instead of going uh, some of the light, instead of going straight to your eye, might have gone slightly to the left or slightly to the right. And these particles of ice might deflect it toward your eye. And the way they do that will form, just because of the, the physics of it, will form a circular ring of colors around the moon. And you'll notice that that ring around the moon isn't all just a bright ring. You see different colors in there. It basically forms like a rainbow. A rainbow effect is caused by the same thing, just with droplets of water. And different colors of light will take a slightly different path when they get refracted through uh, droplets of water or through little bits of ice. And so uh, the different colors are kind of spread out. So that we'll see a kind of a rainbow around the ring. How does the moon move around the Earth? You guys have a lot of questions. This is awesome. So how does the moon move around the Earth? Well, so... I mentioned this earlier, so if you're tuning in just now, that's totally fine. The Earth, sorry, the moon formed. The moon formed when a chunk of stuff about the size of Mars 
way early in the moon's in the Earth's history, uh, collided with the Earth, and it knocked off a chunk of the Earth, which eventually formed the moon. So that chunk of the Earth that got knocked off had a bit of speed, but it didn't have enough speed to fly away from the Earth. So the Earth kind of pulled on it, slowing it down, until it got caught into orbit around the Earth. And so the moon is stuck in an orbit going around the Earth, much like a satellite will be orbiting around the Earth. So the reason why it's moving around the Earth is because it had some speed at some point, and it continues to move around the Earth. And there's really no stopping its movement. It's way too big to slow down, so it will continue to orbit around the Earth. Uh, when we expand on the computer and see a white area at like 2 o'clock, is that the polar ice cap? Uh, I don't believe we're actually able to see the polar ice cap. That... Oh, uh... Give me one quick second. I believe I actually know what, uh, what area that is. Let me pull up the map of Mars to make sure I got the, uh, the terminology right. I believe that is Hellas uh, Polynesia. It's a, an albedo feature on the surface of Mars, or a brighter area on the surface of Mars. Let me double check that real quick. Yeah, that is Hellas Planitia. So you have a good eye. That is not the ice cap, though. Unfortunately, that is not quite visible. Especially not with the uh, blurry photo here. The ice caps on Mars are rather small. Is Mars bigger than the Earth? No, Mars is actually smaller than the Earth. Uh, the Earth is the largest of the inner four planets in our solar system. The second largest is Venus, and only a smidge smaller than the Earth. So Mars is actually quite a bit smaller than the Earth. However, it is bigger than the Moon. Alright, you guys have a ton of great questions. This is awesome. Oh, somebody asked, are there aliens on Mars or in the galaxy? We don't know of any aliens. That's not to say that they don't exist. It's just to say that we haven't found any, if they do exist. So, as it stands right now, the only life we know of is that on Earth. So again, there could be life elsewhere, but we haven't found anything yet, if it exists. So I can't answer if there are aliens on Mars or elsewhere in the galaxy. We just don't know. However, I can't say that we're pretty certain there aren't any aliens on Mars, because that's close enough that we probably would have found them by now. However, there are scientists which are very, very interested... Sorry, very, very interested in uh, whether or not there is microbial life on the surface of Mars. That is to say whether there are single-celled organisms, bacteria, things like that, that might be living on the surface of Mars. They are quite a bit harder to find than any aliens that might be able to talk to us. So we really just have to go there and look for them. And there are some uh, missions to Mars which have tried to look for this life, but so far they've been unsuccessful. So we don't know if there is life on Mars or not, but we are actively looking, and that would be a bit easier to find out than if there are aliens on Mars. Will there be a rover landing on Mars soon? Yes, there will be a rover landing on Mars soon. In fact, it's more than just a rover. So there are currently three missions uh, going to Mars. One mission from uh, one mission from the United Arab Emirates, another mission from, I believe, China, and a mission from the U.S. The mission from the U.S. is going to uh, put a rover on the surface of Mars known as Perseverance, and it's also going to bring with it a tiny little helicopter, uh, essentially like a drone. So it's bringing a rover and a tiny helicopter to Mars. So it's more than just a rover. But yeah, that landing is coming up relatively soon. I don't remember exactly when, though. How big is Mars? I believe Mars is somewhere around half the size of the Earth. Give or take. Be closer to two-thirds see here. That's somewhere around half the size of the Earth, give or take. So about twice as large as the Moon. Yes, so Mars Perseverance, that rover, will be landing on the surface of Mars in just about a month on February 18th. Is that Elon Musk's gig landing on Mars? Not this time, although he does want to bring SpaceX, or does want to use SpaceX to get stuff to Mars. But at the moment... SpaceX is not uh, landing anything on Mars. They're working up to it, but they haven't got there yet. Currently, they are very much doing stuff just around the Earth. All right.
if black holes exist, how can... If black holes exist, I'm not quite sure what that question is. How, ca how can we know if any rockets go through them? So, black holes definitely do exist. We, we are very, very certain about that. Uh, the terminology of a black hole is to say that we can't see anything from it. No light can escape, and light is the fastest thing there is. So, anything that goes into a black hole, in order to escape, would have to go faster than the speed of light, which is impossible. So nothing can escape a black hole when it goes in there. Which means if we were to send a rocket into a black hole, it would just get sucked into the black hole. It would never come out. So a rocket can't go through a black hole, but it can definitely go into a black hole. But again, it's not coming out. And we would never quite know what happens to it when it goes into the black hole because it can't send information out. It can't like point its radio at us and talk to us because the radio uses light and that light can't escape. How fast does the moon move? I'm not entirely certain uh, the actual physical speed of the moon, I apologize, but it does take about a month, more accurately, uh, I believe 29 and a half days, to orbit around the Earth. So in terms of an angular speed, the speed in a, uh, in a circle, it takes about a month to go around the Earth. So yeah, I can't answer any more specifically than that, I apologize, I don't know its speed in terms of like miles an hour. Is it true that every star is a black hole? Absolutely not. So, no, black holes are actually a totally different thing than stars. Stars, very, very large stars, rather, very, very uh, close to the end of their lives, can explode in a supernova, and when they do that, they can form a black hole. So black holes will form from a dying star. But stars and black holes are two very, very different things. Besides Perseverance coming up, is there any equipment now on Mars? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, there are at least two ongoing missions I'm aware of. There is the Curiosity rover, which is currently an active rover moving around on the surface of Mars. That's been there since, I believe, 2012. And there's also the InSight mission, uh, which is a lander. So, that's to say it doesn't actually move around on the surface of Mars. It's stuck in one place. Uh which landed on the surface of Mars in, I believe, 2018. And its mission was uh, largely to, to basically drill a, drill a hole and put a sensor down into Mars to study Mars quakes, but it couldn't quite do that. And also to study the uh, temperature of the internal internal uh, inside of Mars. But that, that part of the mission, unfortunately, was just recently declared a failure because uh, the surface of Mars that it landed on, the, the soil basically wasn't quite what the scientists expected it to be, so it couldn't quite drill through it. But uh, it's done other stuff, like record seismic data using a seismometer, the seismograph, whichever one of the term is, uh, on the surface of Mars. And it's done a few other things as well. There are also several orbiters, or basically satellites, which are going around Mars, orbiting around it, taking pictures of its surface and studying it from space. So much like we might have satellites on the Earth, which can study cloud patterns or can study other things using cameras or other sensors to study the Earth, we have spacecraft around Mars, also around the Moon, uh, which will study the surface of Mars or the Moon. Do wormholes exist? Wormholes, to our knowledge, are a purely, uh, purely mathematical construct. So it seems that the equations laid out by Einstein, by Albert Einstein, in his theory of general relativity, suggest that wormholes could exist, but in order for them to exist, you kind of have to make some assumptions uh, about reality, which are very, very hard to prove. So, for instance, you'd have to have basically negative weight or negative mass, and that's not really a realistic thing. So, wormholes don't violate the mathematics of physics, but they do seem to violate the reality as we know it. So unless we were to discover something new in physics, uh, which would blow our minds if we did, 
unless we were to discover something brand new in physics, it doesn't seem that wormholes exist. It's incredibly unlikely, but mathematically speaking, it's not necessarily impossible. It's just, based on our current understanding, it, they probably don't exist. Are Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, or Uranus visible tonight through the telescope? Yes, I was actually hoping to get to this. So, Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn are not visible. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn, I believe, were visible. Or no, and Mercury, actually, were visible slightly earlier. But unfortunately, uh, we started too late to really see them. They have set below the horizon. Venus is also not visible uh, at the moment. However, Uranus is. So, very conveniently, this is totally coincidental, uh, Uranus is pretty much right next to Mars in the sky. So it's in the same general area. So... Ah, uh, no, it seems that, uh... My telescope view has drifted a little bit, so bear with me, I'm gonna have to align this telescope again. Point it to Mars and get that centered here and do a quick little thing. Bear with me for just one second. Alright, now let's go ahead and move this over to Mars. Or sorry, uh, Uranus, my bad. So, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but uh, Uranus is quite a bit further away from the Earth than Mars or the Moon are. And so, it appears as a very, very, very faint dot in our telescope view here. We can't actually, because of the, uh, the wind, unfortunately, we really can't see any details to it on its surface. However, we can see it as... It's kind of like greenish, bluish blob moving around. The little shakiness there is because of the wind. But you can see its color is kind of bluish green. So that's about all, unfortunately, that we can see for Uranus. But it is visible. Yeah, so that dot is Uranus, unfortunately. That's all that we can see of Uranus. However... I can turn our telescope over to see some other cool things in the sky. Unless anybody has any questions about Uranus that I can try to answer. Or Mars or anything else. Alright, I will take that as a no on Uranus, which is totally fine. Alright, so... I am going to move us over to a constellation known as Orion, which if you were to go outside right now and look up at the moon and use that as a, as a <clears throat> sorry, use that as a frame of reference, if you were to look out to the moon and then turn pretty much to your left, you would find Orion. Uh, it has a very distinct group of three stars right at the center that form a tiny line known as Orion's Belt. With this telescope, I'm not going to be able to show the entire constellation of Orion, but I can look at parts of it. So I'm going to start off by moving the telescope over to a reddish star, which you'd see off to the left of those three stars right now that are Orion's belt. And this reddish orangish star is known as Betelgeuse. So in ancient Greek mythology, Orion is supposed to be a hunter, so he's a person. And Betelgeuse sounds like kind of a cool name in English, but it literally translates to armpit. Betelgeuse is the armpit of Orion. It's going to take a little bit of time for me to get to, I apologize. So Betelgeuse is actually a really, really kind of awesome star. Some of you might have heard of Betelgeuse because it was in the news recently, about a year or two ago. So. Betelgeuse is a star that is right at the end of its life. It doesn't have a whole lot of time left. And so astronomers started to notice that for some reason, and I don't believe it's still quite figured out what happened, 
uh, Beetlejuice started to get dim all of a sudden. And we weren't certain if Beetlejuice was about to die. It was about to explode in a fiery explosion called a supernova. So it was getting really, really, really interesting to astronomers at the time because over about the course of a month, it got way dimmer than it used to be. And so we weren't sure if it was about to explode, but fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective there, it did not uh, go supernova. So there we go. So this star that we see right over there is the star of Betelgeuse. So Betelgeuse, as I said, is a star toward the end of its life. And what sometimes happens with stars like that is that they might start to get really, really, really big. So Betelgeuse is what's known as a red supergiant. It is huge. It is several hundred times larger than our sun. Betelgeuse is so large that if you took our sun and you replaced it with Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse would be so big that its surface would go out past Jupiter. So that star would swallow up all of the inner planets of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the entirety of the asteroid belt, and Jupiter. It is a huge star. But it's also really, really far away. So even though it's a gigantic star, much bigger than our sun, because it's so far away, we just see it as kind of a dim star in the sky. It's only about the uh, ninth brightest star in the night sky, if memory serves. However, something pretty cool about it is we actually don't see all... Ah. All right, so it seems like the, uh, the dimming of Betelgeuse was caused by a large outburst of gas that obscured a bit of its surface. So it, a lot of this gas blocked some of its surface, so we couldn't quite see all of the light it was putting out, making it appear quite a bit dimmer. So thank you, Amy. So, um, Betelgeuse, as I mentioned, is a red star. And what that actually means is that most of the light that Betelgeuse is putting out is not actually visible light. It is a color known as infrared. So we humans actually perceive infrared light as heat, and we don't really see it. But if you were able to see infrared light, you would actually see Betelgeuse as the brightest star in the night sky. So it's only the ninth brightest star in the visible night sky. This guy is, we see it because we just can't see most of its light, which is, I think, pretty cool. So I'm going to go ahead and move the telescope over to something else uh, in Orion, known as the Orion Nebula. A nebula is a large collection of gas and dust out in space. It looks like a cloud, cloudy thing in the sky, which is why we call it nebula. That's Latin for cloud. So let's go ahead and move our telescope over to the Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula is quite a bit dimmer than everything else that we've looked at tonight. And so to see it, I'm definitely going to have to take a long duration picture of this area of the sky. But something you might see here, right over here, you might see what looks like about three-ish stars. That is a group of stars right at the center of Orion known as the Trapezium, which is a pretty convenient uh, thing to find because I could still see it in the, uh, in the camera without taking a long duration photograph so we can actually center it here. But I am going to set this up to take a photograph of this area. And it's going to show a photo of Mars for a little bit. I apologize. In about 45 seconds, it'll go away. Or not. There we go. Let's try this again. Anyway, so we can, uh, we can use these brighter stars in this area to help us align the telescope and help us align the camera so that we can actually get a, a better view of everything else. So... The wind seems to be pretty low right now, so hopefully we'll get a nice crisp and sharp photo of this area. If not, I apologize if it's any uh, a little bit blurry. But uh, any second now, we should be able to see this. Let's have to wait a little bit longer. So the Orion Nebula is a big, huge collection of gas and dust out in space that formed a very long time ago 
when a very large star exploded in a supernova. And it spewed a whole bunch of gas. Oh, there we go. Awesome. So, let's see if I can uh, move that view just a little bit. Just center that a bit better. Bear with me, I apologize. It's gonna show a shaky photo for another about a minute. And then after that, we should get a nicer photo. That uh, shaky photo is because I touched the telescope while I was trying to take a picture and I canceled the photo. But, uh, yeah, so this formed from a, a star that exploded a very long time ago and it spewed a whole bunch of gas and dust out into space. And slowly over time, gravity can cause this gas and dust to start to collapse again and form new stars. So nebulae like the Orion Nebula here are also known as stellar nurseries, places where stars are born. And uh, so all of these stars are very, very young. They're very, very hot. They're very, very bright. And so they light up this nebula, allowing us to see it. There we go. Awesome. Let's see if I can take a slightly uh, longer photo here. Maybe we can see a bit more. Or, you know, that's actually... Let's see what I can do here to clean that up. No, that's not that great. Oh, well, I tried. So, uh, yeah, so... There are a few different types of, of nebulae. Uh, the Orion Nebula is something known as a reflection nebula. So that's... Uh, it's called that because of all these stars in the nebula. They're very, very hot, very bright, and as I said, they're lighting up the galaxy, allowing us... Or sorry, the uh, nebula, allowing us to see it. So the light from those stars is reflecting on the gas and dust in the nebula, lighting it up. There are other types of nebulae, such as emission nebulae, which are where some light is passing through the nebula and causes the uh, the gas in the nebula to re-emit light in a slightly different way. But the Orion Nebula here is a reflection nebula, so we can see all of these stars, like the stars in the trapezium and like some other bright stars here, are stars within the Orion Nebula itself that have formed there, that were born there, and that are lighting this thing up, allowing us to see it pretty well. So you might also notice, unfortunately, that the background has a whole lot of gray. So the photographs I'm currently taking of this area of the sky, I'm taking a roughly 45 second picture with this camera. So unlike the human eye, which pretty much like continuously sees light, we can't just like stare at an area and, and get a brighter and brighter, more detailed image, right? A camera can continue to point and look at one thing for a very long duration of time, for pretty much however long I want it to, and it will collect more and more and more light. When we're looking up at the sky right now, if you were if you were outside and looked up at the sky, you'd notice it should appear pretty dark, almost black, although not quite. And if you were out in a really, really, in a, in a place really far away from a lot of people, the sky should look really, really, really black. But the closer to other people you get, the more and more the light from the surrounding area, from people people's homes or cars or from other buildings, the more and more and more that light starts to bounce around in the air come back to you in what astronomers call light pollution. You don't see the light pollution so much on its own as much as you do the fact that it kind of washes out of the stars in the sky. But pointing a camera at an area of the sky for a long time, we start to capture a lot of that light pollution and it just starts to make the background of the image a little bit gray and kind of muddy. So it doesn't really look all that nice. So someone asked if we'll be able to see the Horsehead Nebula. Oh, I also missed someone else's question, I apologize, on why the, uh, why Uranus has the, kind of the color of the sky. Although it seems that was already answered. So yeah, it's due to methane, uh, deep in the clouds of Uranus. So, um, will we, will we be able to see the Horsehead Nebula? So I mentioned before the two different, uh, or two different types of nebulae. We have Reflection Nebulae and Emission Nebulae. And... Reflection nebulae tend to be a bit brighter. So, the Horsehead Nebula is uh, in an area very, very close to the Orion Nebula. It's also a part of uh, the constellation of Orion. But unfortunately, it's a very, very, very dim 
emission nebula. And that means two things. First off, with the light pollution we have here in, uh, in Glassboro around the Edelman Planetarium, um, I can only see some of the brighter objects in the sky. Anything dimmer uh, than the local light pollution, I would have to use a lot of photo editing to really bring out some, some very fine details, like a dim thing in the sky. I'd have to do a whole lot of work to actually see some things. So the, the Horsehead Nebula is a bit dimmer than the surrounding light pollution, so it's, it's really almost impossible to see through a telescope here, even with the best of cameras. Uh, I would really have to do a number of, of photographic techniques or some other things to really see it. On top of that, it's also a very, very dark nebula on its own. So even if you're in a really dark, dark location, far away from other people and very little light pollution, you can't really see it with the human eye. You really have to use a telescope with a camera for a long duration, with a long duration photograph, to kind of barely see it. It's, it's very, very, very difficult to see, so we're definitely not seeing it. Uh, from here, although I would very much like to be able to, because that, that would just be awesome. How big is the galaxy? I assume you mean our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So, the Milky Way galaxy is, uh, I believe it's roughly 100,000 light years across, although I believe there might have been a recent study that actually put that figure closer to about twice as large, 200,000 light years across. So either it's between one and 200,000 light years across, I believe 100,000 light years across. One light year is how far you can travel going at the speed of light for one year. The speed of light is really, 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 really fast. It is about 200,000, or, yeah, I believe 200,000, uh, miles per second. So imagine going at that speed for a year. A light year is really far, and our galaxy is about a hundred thousand light years side to side. So if you could travel at the speed of light, it would take you about a tenth of a million years to get from one side to the other. It's really, 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 really crazy big. All right. Does anybody have any questions about the Orion Nebula? or anything else for that matter. You know, again, feel free to unmute yourselves. If you, I think I just saw someone raise your hand. I actually don't see a whole lot of the uh, Zoom chat here, or the Zoom, sorry, the, uh, the camera feeds, but uh, feel free just to unmute yourself and just ask your question. You don't need to raise your hand and wait on me. Go ahead. A fact about the sun? What's your fact? Uh, yeah, yeah, about a million Earths can fit inside the sun. So yeah, the sun is about a uh, hundred times wider than the Earth. And that means that if we're measuring in terms of width, the sun is about a hundred times the size of the Earth. But if we measure in terms of volume, of how much stuff you can cram inside of the sun, it's about a hundred times a hundred times a hundred, or about a million times the size of the Earth, or we could fit about a million Earths inside of it. So yeah, the, the sun is really, really, really big. On that note, um, we can also fit about a thousand Earths inside of Jupiter. So Jupiter is a little more than 10 times the size of the Earth. I believe it's about 12 times the size of the Earth. So we can fit around a thousand-ish Earths inside and about a thousand Jupiters inside of the sun. All right. Cool, so, I'm going to move us over to uh, another area. If you were to go outside and look at Orion, I mentioned before Orion has a group of three stars at its center that form a straight line known as Orion's Belt. If you were to follow uh, tonight, Orion's Belt pretty much straight up, you'll come across a kind of V-shaped thing with a red dot, a red star, at uh, one of the one of the sides of the V. That V-shaped thing is the head of the constellation known as Taurus the Bull, and that orangish reddish star we see there is known as Aldebaran. Uh, Taurus is a pretty large constellation that some of you might have heard of before, and it's pretty neat because it has an object within it, kind of off to the. Uh, right of the V, or just kind of continue in that same general line from Orion's Belt. 
and you'll see what kind of looks like a tiny little dipper. Now that tiny little dipper that we see is a group of stars known as the Pleiades. The Pleiades is a star cluster. Ooh, that's a good photo there of Orion. The Pleiades is what's known as a star cluster. So I mentioned before that Orion is a stellar nursery, a place where stars are constantly being born. Well, these stars that are born, they're all born really, really close together. Huh. Oh. So these stars that are being born, they're being born very, very, very close together. And they're all gravitationally bound together. So just like the moon is gravitationally bound to the Earth, the Earth's gravity keeps it from flying away. And just like how all the planets are bound to the sun, again, by gravity. Gravity keeps them from just leaving the solar system. These stars are all close enough together that they lightly tug on each other, and they keep each other close. So they travel together. They will travel together through space as a kind of small group of stars, kind of like a family of stars, or a star cluster. So the Pleiades... Excuse me one second to get the telescope to go over there. The Pleiades is a star cluster that formed within a nebula a long time ago and has since left its nebula and is just traveling through space. I'm not sure exactly how much of the Pleiades we would be able to see. Apologies for the noise of the telescope there. I don't think we'll be able to see a whole lot of the Pleiades because it's a kind of large thing in the sky. So I think it'll be a bit too big for the camera to see all at once, but we should be able to see a bit of it. Let's take a picture to see what happens. So uh, we have a, this is a, the Pleiades is a star cluster, as I said before. And so we have, again, this group of stars all traveling together through space. And because of that, they're all really, really close together. And if you were to take binoculars and point them to this star cluster, you'll see a bunch of stars really, really kind of packed closely, tightly together. And uh, so if, if we were able to see all these stars far brighter than we can uh, right now, we would see just this big, huge collection of stars really, really, really tightly packed together. And hopefully, assuming everything works well here, we should be able to see a ton of stars in this view. Ah, oh, no, it's shaky. Let's try that again. This might not work so well. I might have to go to something else. Anyway, uh, somebody in the chat just to take a question here. Somebody in the chat asked which dwarf planet is oval-shaped. Well, uh, I'm not entirely certain, actually. Uh, I apologize. Give me one second. I can try to look that one up. Well, it wouldn't quite be uh, oval-shaped. An oval is a two-dimensional thing like a circle. Uh, planets are three-dimensional things, so whereas the three-dimensional equivalent of a circle is a sphere. Uh, planets are known as sphere, they form a spheroidal shape. Not quite a sphere, a little like a sphere but bulging a bit at the, around the, uh, the middle of the equator. So all planets actually are a little bit somewhat oval shaped in a sense, but some things, or a dwarf planet in this case, can be a bit further oval shaped. Or, or, uh, anyway, so the dwarf planet in question is the dwarf planet of Haumea, out in the Kuiper Belt, so out past the orbit of Neptune. So hopefully that answered your question. So now that we have a somewhat okay photo here of the Pleiades, unfortunately, I didn't think about this ahead of time, um, you can also see some light around the edges here. And that's because the telescope is not perfect and also because of the uh, moon. So we're actually getting some light messing up my photograph here of the uh, Pleiades. But uh, we see a whole lot of stars. There are a whole lot of stars in this view, far more than we were seeing before when we were looking around, um, say, Mars, or around the Orion Nebula or around Betelgeuse. And that's because these star clusters are very, very, very dense with stars. We have a ton of stars all in one little chunk of the sky. 
So star clusters can be a lot of fun to look at. Uh, unfortunately, the zoom, the zoom factor here at the telescope, the magnification rather, is a bit too high. So we are actually looking at a section of this star cluster. But if you were to take a pair of binoculars and look out at the Pleiades tonight, uh, it would look a little bit better. So, because you, uh, you'd you be looking at a wider area, so you'd see more of those stars all in that same view. So someone asked how stars are born. So, uh, going back to the Orion Nebula, which uh, we were looking at just before, the Orion Nebula is a large collection of gas and dust out in space, and over time, gravity can start to cause little clumps to form inside of this gas and dust. And then those clumps are now a bit of a higher concentration, a bit of matter out in space, and they have a bit more gravity, and they can start to pull on more gas and dust. And then you start to get more gas and dust flowing toward that bit, and more, 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 until eventually, a star is born. So, this gas and dust as it coalesces, as it comes down together, can form stars, and then you have stuff around the stars that can eventually form planets in some cases. So these stars are often born in these regions of space, and nebulae, which are known as uh, stellar nurseries, because again, they're places where stars are born. And again, the Orion Nebula is a really, really great example of that. All right, so I'm sure that there are a number of people uh, checking in, tuning in now who were not here at the beginning when we were looking at the moon. So I'm actually going to go ahead and move us back to the moon for a little bit while I get some other stuff set up. In the meantime, somebody asked how stars blow up. So stars can blow up at the end of their lives in a supernova. And the way that that occurs is actually a little cool. It's probably not what you think of. So the stars don't actually blow up as much as they kind of do the opposite. So something blowing up is known as exploding. It's an explosion when something goes and expands very, very rapidly. It's an explosion. And implosion is the opposite. So in a supernova, when a star quote unquote blows up, the star actually collapses first. So what's going on is that uh, a star is a very, very, very hot thing. It's a very fluid thing. It's a big old ball of plasma or basically gas and it's very hot. So this heat causes it to, to kind of try to swell in size. And uh, give me one second as I move this over to the moon. So this heat can kind of keep a, a star in a sense inflated, sort of like a balloon. And this heat is coming from the nuclear fusion at the core of this star, from hydrogen fusing into helium and releasing a bunch of heat. Later on in the life of a star, you can start to form some other uh, elements. So helium can fuse into other things, and those other things can start to fuse together, etc., 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 until eventually, whoa, that's way too bright, until eventually we start to form the element of iron. And once iron starts to form, nuclear fusion stops dead in its tracks. So once that nuclear fusion is stopped, and that star is no longer producing any heat, all of a sudden, that kind of balloon effect I described before just stops working as well. Gravity starts to take over, and it starts to pull that gas and such, the plasma within the star, down. It starts to shrink the star. And as it starts to shrink the star more and more and more and more, that star all of a sudden starts to heat up a lot. And all of a sudden, you'll start to get more nuclear fusion occurring. And then all of a sudden, that star is heating up way too fast and then it explodes. So first the star collapses in on itself into uh, doing an, an implosion, and then it explodes in a fiery burst of a supernova. So really, it's kind of weird, right? The star first falls in upon itself, and only then can that star explode and die in a fiery supernova. So, Something else kind of cool there. That's actually um, just as a, a slight tangent. Um, when that star is imploding, it's falling in on itself. That's actually how we can form things like a black hole. I mentioned way early on that black holes can form during a supernova. 
So when the core of this star is having all the other stuff fall in on it, and it starts to get really dense, and stuff starts to cram together, stuff can cram together so hard that it will form, or can form, a black hole. If the star isn't quite big enough, or there isn't quite enough force in that supernova, in that initial implosion, then instead of forming a black hole, we can actually form something known as a neutron star, which is basically a, the dead core of a star teetering right on the edge of collapsing into a black hole. It's got just enough stuff in it pushing outward that it can barely resist becoming a black hole, but it doesn't quite turn into a black hole. However, some pretty cool stuff can occur if you have a neutron star uh, that's in a binary star system, in a system with another star, where two stars are orbiting each other, if the neutron star is too close to the other star, it can slowly pull gas off of the upper atmosphere of that star. And as this gas falls onto the neutron star, it starts to collapse the core a little bit. And if you have too much gas fall onto that neutron star, this neutron star, which again, remember, formed from a star exploding, can then explode again. So it will explode and it will also collapse down into a black hole. So this neutron star, or the dead core of this star, which survived becoming a black hole, can then be doomed to that fate that it just so narrowly avoided. All right, so for the people tuning in here, uh, we're currently looking at the moon and we're currently in what's known as the first quarter phase of the moon. So that means that about a week ago, we were looking at the new moon phase, which is when the moon is roughly between the Earth and the sun. And so we're looking at the night, we were looking at the nighttime side of the moon. And as its orbit has brought it around the Earth, we're now able to see about half of the daytime side of the moon. And we're also able to see about half of the nighttime side of the moon. The line right between the daytime and nighttime side, where right now this area is going into uh, morning, is known as the Terminator. And right along the Terminator of the moon here, no relation to the uh, movie, by the way, right along the Terminator of the moon here, we can actually see a whole bunch of really cool kind of craters here. Not kind of craters, sorry, just craters. And we can also see the shadows cast by the sunlight in and on these craters. And the closer you are to the Terminator, if you were standing like right there on the surface of the moon, I'm not sure if the curse is showing up all that well in the stream. If you're standing like right about there on the surface of the moon, you'd be just barely seeing the, the sun coming up over the horizon on the moon. And the further away you get from the Terminator over there, you're getting further and further later into the day essentially, and the sun is higher and higher in the sky. And so the angle we see the sun in the sky is going to affect how deep these shadows are, basically, or in, a, in a sense, in a way. And so you can see the, uh, the craters, which are further from the Terminator, have less shadow visible, because more of the sun is uh, lighting up the inside of the craters, whereas the ones right at the Terminator are mostly still covered with uh, craters. The uh, areas inside of the craters, which are somewhat deep, you aren't quite able to see the uh, sun. It's not quite high enough in the sky to be visible. So, uh, craters like this form when asteroids collide with the surface of the moon, knocking out a chunk and basically forming a little dent in the surface of the moon. And a very long time ago, some very large craters were formed, these darker areas. You might notice that they're a little bit circular, and when that occurred, lava from beneath the surface of the moon was able to come up and fill these craters basically forming lakes of lava that cool down to form volcanic plains. So these darker areas are known as maria, meaning seas or lakes or oceans. And that's not because they were at one point basically lava seas. It's because early observers looking at the moon thought that they were seas or lakes or oceans. They thought this was actually water on the surface of the moon. Now, of course, nowadays we know that's not the case, but a long time ago, before there were telescopes, before we could really see the moon in good detail, and of course before we visited there, we couldn't quite be certain what the moon was made of. Nobody really quite knew, and so people thought that that might have been water. Now again, we know that's not the case now, but that's what uh, people used to think, and we are stuck with the name of Maria. So, what I'm going to try to do now 
is something that might not work all that well. I'm not quite sure how the moon is going to get in the way, but let's see. This is a stretch. I am going to try to point us to something we haven't seen before. So tonight we've so far seen the moon, we've seen a couple planets, we've seen uh, Mars and Uranus, and we've seen a nebula, we've seen the Orion Nebula, and we've seen a star cluster, the uh, Pleiades, as well as a star, uh, Betelgeuse. What we haven't seen is a galaxy. So I am going to try to point us at a galaxy known as the Andromeda Galaxy. Now, the Andromeda Galaxy is called the Andromeda Galaxy because it's a galaxy in the constellation of Andromeda. As you can see, astronomers are super creative, right? We have the Orion Nebula, the Nebula in Orion, and we have the Andromeda Galaxy, the galaxy in Andromeda. The Andromeda Galaxy, uh, just a hundred or so years ago, was actually known as the Andromeda Nebula. And that's because, for a long time, we didn't actually think that, oh, sorry for that bright image there. We didn't actually think that other galaxies existed. So until we were able to uh, use various methods to measure the distances to things in space, we just figured that our galaxy was all that there was and that uh, all the fuzzy patches we saw in the sky, the nebulous things, the things that look vaguely like clouds, were just kind of like cloud things out in space, all part of our galaxy. So before we can measure the size of our galaxy, and before we can measure how far other objects were away, we just figured that our galaxy was all that there was, that we were basically, that the galaxy was basically the universe. And then some, some astronomers uh, who were working on measuring distances, there we go, who were working on measuring distances to things in space, were able to calculate the distance to the then what it was known as the Andromeda Nebula, and they were able to determine that it was really far away. Uh, I believe the earlier calculations for its distance were somewhere around a million light years away. Now at the time, they knew the, the uh, Milky Way to be roughly about 100,000 uh, light years across. So if our Milky Way was 100,000 light years across, and this thing was a million light years away, well, it couldn't possibly be a part of our galaxy, right? And so people realized like, oh wait, that's not a nebula out in space. That must be a whole other galaxy. And so the Andromeda galaxy was the first other galaxy found. What's pretty cool about the Andromeda galaxy, I'm gonna see if I can uh, move our view here to actually kind of center it a bit better. I'll explain what we're seeing in a little bit. Uh, what's cool about the Andromeda Galaxy is that it's actually relatively close to us. Now again, I say relatively because it's still really far away, right? At about a million uh, light years away. It's, now that we know a bit more about it, we know it to be about two and a half million with better measurements um, light years away. It's, it's relatively close as galaxies go. Most galaxies are way further away from us than the Andromeda Galaxy is. So the Andromeda Galaxy is what's known... Or sorry, the Andromeda Galaxy, my bad, is a member of what's known as the local group, our local collection of galaxies. So it is the largest member of their local group, and about twice as large as our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and the Milky Way is the second largest member of the local group. So much like we can have star clusters uh, out in space all traveling together, let's see if uh, I can try to center that a bit, maybe a bit better. I'm not sure how well that'll work. I think that unfortunately we might be uh, getting messed up by the moon a bit. Um, but, uh, much like we can have star clusters, groups of stars that move together through the galaxy as one group, where they're uh, together as a group, they travel together as a group, they're kind of stuck together. Just like how we can have those star clusters, we can also have groups of galaxies that cluster together and will travel together as a group through the universe. 
So our local group is our local tiny cluster of galaxies, and it's also part of a larger cluster known as the Virgo Supercluster. And I won't get into that, but there are some other members of our local group as well. So the largest member is the Andromeda Galaxy, what we're seeing here. Second largest is our Milky Way. The third largest is something known as the uh, Triangulum Galaxy, which is in a close by region of the sky, but which unfortunately we won't be able to see because it's a bit dimmer. And what's pretty neat is that we are close enough to the Andromeda Galaxy here that we have a pretty strong pull on it and it on us, on our galaxy. And our galaxy and the Andromeda Galaxy are actually slowly but surely traveling toward one another. So in about four and a half billion years, about as long as the Earth has been around, mind you, our galaxy and the Andromeda Galaxy will actually merge. They will collide with each other and they'll merge to form a way larger galaxy. When galaxies collide and merge, they don't annihilate, they don't destroy each other. They just form a bigger galaxy. That's actually how galaxies get this large in the first place. They collide with and merge with smaller galaxies and build up to form bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger galaxies. Our galaxy has collided with several galaxies in the past, and some of those collisions are actually slowly ongoing in a way. So, we have a, a few galaxies, a couple galaxies, that orbit around our galaxy, known as satellite galaxies, and we slowly steal stars away from them. So, as they orbit around us, we, take its, we can take some of their stars and make them a part of our galaxy. So we slowly but surely can merge with these galaxies. That's not what's happening with the Andromeda Galaxy here, though. So, the Andromeda Galaxy is what's known as a spiral-type galaxy. And that's actually the same type of galaxy that our galaxy is. This is probably the type of galaxy you think of when you see a galaxy. That is to say, it's a roughly disc-shaped thing with some spiral arms coming out of it. So, unfortunately, we can't really see that spiral shape or structure too well with the Andromeda Galaxy for a few reasons. But if I was in a very, very, very dark place and uh, the moon weren't out, I'd be able to see it. So I mentioned before uh, that we experience here something known as light pollution. So here in Glassboro, we're about 30-ish minutes outside of Philadelphia, and we're in southern New Jersey. We have a whole lot of people in this general area. And all of these people tend to have lights around them. We have lights in our cars, in our homes, in our businesses, etc. With street lights and what have you. And all of this light bounces around a bit in the air. And it comes back to us. And it ruins our view of the night sky. So the more lights we have around us, the less we can see in the night sky. Anything in the sky that's dimmer than that light pollution gets really, really washed out. So... This galaxy, the Andromeda Galaxy, is really, really, really large, and it has a whole lot of stars in it. It has a couple trillion or so stars, uh, if memory serves. And those stars are pretty bright, but given its distance, it's not really able to, to fully outshine all of the lights we have around us. And so the light pollution in our skies here wash out most of the galaxy, preventing us from really seeing it, preventing us from seeing the spiral structure to it. Um, but we can see something else. So this fuzzy area we see right at the center of this galaxy, it really is stretching over a larger swath of this image, but we can't see it because of all the light pollution. Although you can see some features of it, like a darker patch right there. Um, this brighter area in the center is known as the nucleus, the core of this galaxy. So toward the center of galaxies, you tend to have a, a higher concentration, a higher number of stars than out toward the edges of it. And so the cores of galaxies, the nucleus of a galaxy, tends to be the brightest area of that galaxy. And so when we're looking at the Andromeda galaxy right now, we're able to see the core of this galaxy located two and a half million light years away, despite all of the light that we're currently seeing. We have light pollution from just the surrounding area of Glassboro, from all the people, and we also have the moon up in the sky, not super far away from this area, this patch of the sky. And so the moon's light washes everything out, light pollution washes everything out, and we can't really see a whole lot. But if you went to a darker area, you'd be able to see a lot more. And you can look up photographs of the Andromeda uh, galaxy to, to see what I'm talking about. 
at some other time, but I'm, I can't really pull any of those up. But while we're here, before I move over to something else, does anybody have any questions? Actually, someone asked uh, if there will be more Earths. I believe that question was in response to or in relation to my comment about the uh, merger in about four and a half billion years of our galaxy with the Andromeda galaxy. So will there be more Earths? Um, I assume what you mean is will there be more planets? Uh, assuming that's what you mean, uh, yes and no. So when we merge with the Andromeda galaxy, or when any two galaxies collide and merge, um, they will form a larger galaxy. And what that means is really all the stars from the one galaxy and all the stars from the other galaxy will now just be all the stars in the new merged galaxy. So you'll have a lot more stars in that galaxy, but it's roughly a similar number to how many were in the first plus the second. However, when galaxies collide, they don't just have the stars come together to form a larger galaxy. Galaxies also have a whole lot of gas and dust in them. And this gas and dust uh, between the two galaxies, this large cloud of gas from one galaxy collides with the cloud of gas from the other galaxy, and you can get a little bit of star formation as a result of that collision. So sometimes when galaxies collide and merge, you do actually start to get a lot more star formation. That does occur. So in a sense, yeah, we would get uh, more planets forming around those stars as well. So we would get more planets, uh, a few more planets as a result of the collision. But I don't believe the rate of star formation from that is always super duper high. I'm not entirely certain there. Uh, somebody asked, is light pollution a problem? Absolutely. Astronomers hate light pollution. Uh, so we, we want to have lights out at night, right? Lights make things safe. It's not really safe to, to go walk down the street necessarily in, in pitch black, right? So we want light. Light is nice. However, that light, when it bounces around in the skies above, it, it muddies out the image that we see. Any stars in the sky, any nebulae, any anything in the sky that is, or rather out in space, that is dimmer than the light pollution that we're seeing here in, a, in our local area is going to get completely washed out by it. So any stars that are dimmer, you really can't see. Uh, so if you were to go outside right now and look up at the night sky, you might see a few stars, but you don't see a whole lot. And that's because of the light pollution. Uh, I'm assuming most of you on Zoom here and most of you um, on uh, watching live on YouTube are probably like us living in New Jersey. New Jersey is the most densely populated state in the entirety of the United States. For the little bit of land we have, we have a lot of people crammed here together. And because we're all so close together, we have a lot of light pollution. We are one of the worst light polluted places in the entire country. Now, it would be even worse if you go into, say, a city where you have a ton of light. But New Jersey as a whole isn't all that great for stargazing. Now, if you were to go out to a state like Nebraska, say, where there are quite a, not quite a uh, lower number of people living there and quite a larger state, where the density of people, the number of people in a given area is far, far, far smaller, you're going to have a lot less light pollution. And because of that, if you were living in the middle of nowhere, elsewhere in the country, or elsewhere in the world, uh, and you, you were somewhere far away from a lot of people where you didn't have much light pollution, if you went outside, unlike here in New Jersey, where you'd see just a few stars up in the sky, maybe a number more if you stare in one patch of the sky and look real carefully. If you walked outside in the middle of nowhere, no one around you, your skies are just filled with stars. There are a couple thousand stars you can see in the night sky in a really, really dark location. Assuming, of course, the moon is also not up. Uh, with the moon, it, it also adds to light pollution. But, uh, if you're in an area with very little light pollution or no light pollution and the skies are much darker, you can see so much more. So if you've ever looked at a constellation and you've looked up like what it's supposed to be, like for instance, uh, the Big Dipper, believe it or not, is part of a larger constellation known as Ursa Major, the Big Bear. It doesn't really look like a bear, but if you were to go to a very, very, very dark location where you could see a lot of stars, you can see why people thousands of years ago looking at all these stars might have seen a shape there. They might have seen it as a bear. 
because when you can see a lot more stars, you can get a bit more of an idea of what something might look like to someone else. If you can see more stars, you have more detail. Uh, it's like when we're looking at constellations today with a whole lot of light pollution like we have uh, nowadays, um, we don't really get the full picture. We see a few stars, but it's really not enough to make out what people were seeing thousands of years ago. Thousands of years ago, when we didn't have a whole lot of artificial lighting out at night, people in most places, even in cities, could walk outside and see a whole lot of stars. You could see a lot of stuff, but the light pollution we have nowadays really gets in the way of us seeing all that stuff in the night sky. So, yes, light pollution is absolutely a problem if you are a fan of astronomy. Uh, ideally, I hope that at some point all of you can get to a very, very dark, uh, dark sky site where you can see the night sky uh, as I believe humans are really intended to see it as much as we can be uh, intended to see something. Because it, it's really, really, really wonderful. You can't see the Milky Way most places in New Jersey because of all of our light pollution. But if you could go somewhere far darker where there wasn't any light pollution, or where there was very minimal light pollution, you can see the Milky Way as a faint band of fuzzy stuff arching all the way across the sky. We don't see that now, and it's so bad, our light pollution tends to be so bad, that there are reports sometimes in uh, cities when the power's gone out, people have gone outside, seen the Milky Way for the first time, and been like, what is that? Oh my god, what is attacking us in the sky, or something along those lines, right? People don't recognize a lot of stuff in the sky because our light pollution is so bad. So hopefully you can get somewhere very, very dark at some point so you can start to see some of these really cool things in the sky because in a lot of places with a lot of light pollution, we really can't see a whole lot. Telescopes can help us capture more light to get through the light pollution a little bit and uh, cameras attached to them can also help a bit, but it really helps just to be able to go somewhere a bit darker. So we're getting kind of close to the uh, end here. But if anybody has any questions, any more questions, feel free just to drop them in the chat, or if you're in the Zoom call here, just feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask what any question, whatever questions you might have. So, does anybody have any last questions? Going once, going twice. Bueller, Bueller. All right, well, if nobody else has any questions, then uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Hopefully you've been able to uh, see some pretty fun stuff here. Uh, feel free, because this should be recorded and up on our YouTube page at the Edelman Planetarium's uh, YouTube page. Uh, you should be able to rewatch this stream and see a lot of the stuff if you want to look back at it at some point in the future. So uh, thanks again for joining us, and uh, we hope to see you again at some point in the future. So thank you, and have a good night. And by all means, go outside. It's a pretty clear night, at least in this area of uh, New Jersey. So if it's clear where you are, go outside and try to look at some of the stuff in the, in the uh, night sky, because there's a lot of really fun stuff. All right, thank you.